disruptors and trends, right? Things that have kind of changed the game a little bit in the technology space, right? We've seen the advent of you know cheaper processing and storage, really easy to get mass amounts of compute power and mass amounts of storage. Just look at Windows Azure and the compute resources that you have with the web roles and work roles, and how fast you can scale those out. And also the storage you have, right? You can anybody today can go up and sign up for 500 terabytes of storage with a credit card. It's pretty easy to get 100 terabytes per storage account. You can have you can have up to five storage accounts. If you need more than that, it's a phone call to Microsoft to say, hey, I'm good for paying for this amount of storage. So you can get virtually limitless storage pretty easily now with these cloud platforms. They're all built on the idea of advances in virtualization. So as virtualization technology has increased, you see people doing private clouds. You see you know, the Windows Azure data centers and Amazon, they're all built off of virtualization internally as well, how they're actually able to enable that scalability and performance that you have. Networking just gets faster, right? People are, have broadband connectivity is almost ubiquitous now. Everybody, a lot of people have it. You see, we can be able to work with our phones, or our data centers can get into our um, high-speed connections to, data, to Microsoft data centers. It's virtually everybody has a good network connection in there. And you see advances internally in the data centers and how they just get faster and faster as well. There's apparently a timer on this slide. Advances in web technology, you see people loading a lot now with you know the web API, everything's gone from SOAP from before to now we're talking about REST APIs and all this stuff. So this gets us into, you know, we talked about the service-oriented approach, we got to build our applications and seeing a trend now when we talk about things we can do here. I'm all about service-oriented and comp composite app applications. I want to assemble different pieces of different um, services to kind of bring the best, best of breed. So then I can kind of offer up one application that kind of takes advantage of everything that I have the ability to work with. It enables me to scale out when I need it, so I can scale out or up then. It gives me that elasticity so I can respond to people's um, kind of load or request on my system whenever I need to do that. It's got to turn a knob in 10, 15 minutes I have, I go from five to 100 servers um, very quickly. Now on the next slide. So I think you'll, you'll see a lot of people moving to hybrid clouds as kind of being the, the new reality in the space. It's really hard to kind of talk to customers and say, hey, you know, as much as you know, Windows Azure is awesome and cool and has this great new technology, all the you know, last 30 years that you built and you know, all that data center up, don't need that anymore, let's go to the cloud. They're not going, that conversation doesn't go very well, or at least doesn't last very long. But it's a conversation, you know, it's how can we adopt this type of hybrid solution where I can take advantage of the things that I have on premises today that we do really well and then take advantage of some things in the cloud that maybe I couldn't do before or didn't have the resources to do before that were very difficult to do before. The cloud opens up a lot of new opportunities. So it's how can I mix the things I need to keep here on premises with the things that are in the cloud? What makes sense to move there? Is there certain data that makes sense to move? Does certain data not make sense to move? Um, can we move some of our compute power to the cloud because it's cheap and I just need to crunch some numbers and I don't need to worry about you know, having the data on premises? or the servers on premises to worry about that because I don't want to have to pay for all these servers that you only use maybe a couple times a year or the last week of the month when I have to do some month in tech processing. So can I leverage a cloud to help me with that type of solution? That obviously makes the architecture more complex, right? Because now I've distributed my system out across multiple data centers. You know, they're very far apart. I, don't, I can't see the Microsoft data center. I see the outside of it, but that's about it. I can't get access to that. So your architecture becomes a little more complex and how can I deal with these things that are now spread out over multiple different systems. How does latency impact it? Because we're going over the internet, the public internet, to get to somebody else. So my application can't handle latency very well or can't handle um, kind of transient errors, right? It's a quick disconnect, and if I just try that request one more time, it'll work. Uh, those type of things become a little more complex to deal with, but definitely a pattern that people can solve. So it's really all about you know balancing the kind of the cost, control, flexibility, and risk with your applications, right? It's seeing you know, what makes sense to move to the cloud? What's the cost that we have in doing that? Does it open up flexibility? Am I okay giving up cost or giving up control? Or does it kind of inhibit me on what I'm doing with their applications? And you see more and more companies kind of moving to this type of idea of composite type of system, right? So Gardner had a, a quote out a while ago where you're seeing 80% you know, of transformational systems implemented by mid, mid-sized and large enterprises will be composition. That's really kind of showing that, hey, you know, as we kind of move forward with cloud computing, you're going to see more and more companies that have to do some sort of data transformation, building out and kind of doing that work over a kind of a service-oriented and, and composite type of approach. They're going to kind of take the best of breed services from maybe different providers, implement them into one solution that they can then leverage. So why do you want to consider a hybrid solution? One is really just to give you that agility maybe you didn't have before. If I have these multiple different systems that I can work with, 
I can then kind of look at it and say, hey, you know, this particular data processing engine, this particular maybe credit card processing thing isn't working for what I need. I want to swap that out and put in something else. So I have that very service-oriented approach where I can kind of mix and match services to give me the agility that I need to work with uh, going forward. You see a lot of improvements in on-premises and in cloud, right? We see that you can how now you have hmm, yeah, private cloud is kind of being a big term. Microsoft likes to go around the private cloud. It's really, I mean, just another, it's easy for marketing to get their hands around private cloud and draw private cloud rather than just saying it's virtualization. But it worked good for marketing guys, so we'll go with that. So you see that, you know, a private cloud and public cloud, how they can maybe mix together. And companies like Microsoft say, well, we have a good private cloud story with our virtualization and Hyper-V. And how can we, can we marry that up with the public cloud and, you know, even next versions of Windows and how they can manage public cloud, private cloud together to make them a much more seamless type of transition. This, the SLA approach becomes a, a big topic, though. We see that a lot with customers that they want to move to the cloud, but they didn't have a very flexible system. We've seen some people, they they like, well, hey, the cloud is great, I want to move there. And as soon as you start digging into their application, it's very tightly coupled. We, see, we take out one piece, and we break four more other pieces in doing it. They weren't, did, weren't um, they're very tightly coupled. We couldn't decompose their application. It wasn't a service-oriented approach, so it became very difficult to put into place. But whereas other app customers, they have a very service-oriented approach, those things they can easily move to the cloud. They just want to take the best of breed. It gives them that agility then, right, to say, hey, some things go to the cloud. I'm going to put this particular service in the cloud because it works better there, and I don't want to deal with it on premise and make it cheaper to run there. So what are some common scenarios and concerns we talk about? One is you know, looking at the cloud and seeing you know, how the cloud can help you. There are certain, uh, certain situations where the cloud may fit your model great, right? The cloud is a great thing for maybe just data processing. It's great for archiving data. <laughs> Uh, I need to do some simple number crunching. I need to scale quickly. But lots of great things where the cloud can help you in that. And kind of looking at the cloud and saying, this is going to fit my model. Does it make sense to move this application to the cloud? Is it going to help, help us in the long haul? But it's important to go that not everything has to live in the cloud or even can live in the cloud. There are certain things that maybe we don't want to move to the cloud. And we talked about those a little bit at the, the panel session at lunch, right? It's, is it a, a HIPAA compliance thing? Is it a PCI compliance thing? We've talked to some customers where they need certain auditability requirements on their data centers. And Microsoft right now, the only compliance they have is the ISO uh, 27001 uh, certification. It's the only one that the, current, the data centers have. The Microsoft data centers that Windows Azure is in may have more certification, but Windows Azure as a platform only has that one today. And you'll see more and more coming. But there are certain customers that because of certain things, certain requirements, they can't move to the cloud. So it's okay. And if those conversations, there's just nothing you can do about them at that point, they have those type of requirements. But it's important to kind of acknowledge that, hey, yo, even though technology is cool, not everything has to go that far. There's, it's fine, the right business problem it makes sense. We can move to the cloud. Security is obviously is a big one. It's a big topic. You know, one of the first questions at the lunch panel today. Security is one of those topics that comes up all the time with cloud computing. We educate customers a lot of times on on the security aspects of the cloud. It's obviously, you know, hey, go look at the white papers that are out there that Microsoft has published. It says, here's Windows Azure at a security level. Here's the things that we've done at a data center level and how we secure your data. Understand it. Do your due diligence, you know, as an architect or a product owner or a CTO going and say, okay, I understand what Microsoft's doing at the data center level, but it still becomes your responsibility as the application developer or architect to not do bad things, right? Because Windows Azure can be a super secure platform, but if you write bad code and let a SQL injection attack in, then that's on you as the application developer, right? The platform, I think Brian Prince was saying, you know, the platform doesn't, the cloud doesn't fix stupid. It's, I mean, you, you have to write good application code just like you would on premises, right? You, you're responsible for that type of application, that type of stuff within your um, solution. The regulatory and certification concerns are all, you know, big when we talk about these a couple of times. We talked about the lunch, the PCI type of stuff, you know. You know, I think you'll see Microsoft getting to that type of level with the data centers and PCI. A lot of customers want to run credit card transactions through Windows Azure. And right now, your only real solution is to kind of outsource that to someone else. It still gets into that hybrid type of model, a service-oriented approach, where hey, we're going to call you know, Authorize.net or PayPal and let them deal with it. But our application isn't going to have to because we're not going to take on that burden of one being a PCI compliant uh, solution. It needs to be expensive. A lot of things can go with that. The HIPAA compliance is an interesting one. You see. Um, a lot of customers asking for that, especially in um, you know, paperwork type of doing with medical records and stuff. And there was a, a case study last week, mid last week, there was a company that just started doing uh, HIPAA compliant data processing with their paperwork in Windows Azure. Um, I forget the name of it, but I pulled that one up and bookmarked it to read later because it sounds like it was one of the first ones I've seen that is actually using Windows Azure and HIPAA compliance. I'd love to know what they're doing 
behind the scenes of more of their architecture and their solution to make it work with HIPAA. So if, you, if those type of concerns are there, um, you can definitely work with them and, and figure out ways to you know, maybe you get around, not get around them, but do the best you can to meet those certifications. I think it's really the key, key with this you know, is kind of really to only move to the cloud those things that benefit you. It's looking at, looking at the cloud and saying, how can this make me money or save me money? Does it give my business a certain thing, a certain agility that maybe I couldn't do before? Does it save us money by having the cloud as part of it? Does it help us execute on some sort of strategic vision? That there are things that we can do now that we maybe couldn't do before with the cloud. We have now these, this new technology that's available. I can do new things with it. I can deploy to new uh, markets. Maybe I was only in the US before because uh, that's where my data centers were at. But maybe now I want to tackle Europe or Asia. It was very easy for me to take my application that I wrote here, say, hey, go deploy it to an Asian data center and we're ready to go. And I have this world class data center over there that I can work with. It kind of taps into the innovation aspect to it, right? New, new things, new technologies, new features begin. I'll, I'll do all sorts of neat, new, cool things maybe we couldn't do before or expensive to do. So, a couple of samples, a quick samples on those. One is kind of the data in motion piece, right? I have my on premise system here, I have this is my application, kind of a black box and a firewall. I got a customer, they need to get some data into my application. But typically, getting data in behind the, through the firewalls is a difficult process, right? You go try to go in. Where's my fancy animation? So it bounces off the firewall, right? But what if we can use the cloud as kind of a relay to move some of that data around? So I can maybe put SQL Azure up in the cloud, I can put my Windows Azure queues there. I can maybe leverage SQL Azure Data Sync to synchronize these two together if I need to do that. And then messages from my happy customer, they can simply go into a message in the queue. Maybe they stay there uh, for a couple minutes up to you know days, they can stay in a queue. And then I can simply go when the time comes and pull them back down, kind of using the cloud as a relay. Put them up in the cloud because it's very easy for this guy to put messages here. I mean, it's very easy for me to make that outbound connection. I can kind of bypass and use this firewall. We have a nice safe area up here to work with. Mass storage is another area you see quite a bit of people looking at the way to kind of offload their storage requirements for their websites to Windows Azure. So I have our database here, some application, and we have you know, documents, images, JavaScript. They can take up a lot of bandwidth. You know, the PDF docs, the, the JPEG and PNG images, they kind of, can be kind of big, but typically don't change very often though, right? Our JavaScript, this stuff here, the, actually the, our kind of secret sauce that produces that HTML, that's the things that are more, probably more likely to change. So what if we took and moved some of that stuff up, uh, up into Windows Azure blob storage? kind of the bigger, heavier things. We can take our documents and images, put them up into Windows Azure and the blob storage and make them publicly accessible in Windows Azure. Make a change to our website that says, hey, you know, when you serve up this application, you're gonna bring the HTML band, you know, that web are just our kind of core logic, that's gonna to go to the customer from our bandwidth on our data center, but you're actually gonna pull down images and stuff from Windows Azure and let Microsoft handle that. So you hit blob.core.windows.net and pull that down as well. And then maybe you turn on the CDN Windows Azure Content Delivery Network to increase your performance there, make that responsiveness a little bit snappier for the users as well. Data archival, I think data archival is one of the kind of interesting ones. We had, um, I talked to a customer once about moving some of their, their documents to Windows Azure. They are an insurance company, and they had just a whole lot of PDF documents they had to maintain. And they basically had this setup. They had a database server, and they had a network storage device that they had. Pretty expensive to maintain, they had you know, people on staff to manage it, and just expensive to keep going. They actually had two of them, because they had one for their primary data center and one for the secondary data center. And they had to keep moving their records back and forth, and they were in the terabytes of storage for the for documents. They had to keep them around for years from regulations. So we're like, well, what if we could leverage the cloud as a way to offload some of that type of stuff? They wanted to keep some of their records on premises because they needed quick access to them. They wanted them there that day. They needed um, them around for maybe other back office reasons. So we're like, well, let's put you know, SQL Azure up there to kind of replicate some of that data. But we can also use blob storage as well. So we talked about, let's move some of that data, some of that data off into the cloud. So you can see that maybe we take, maybe only the last five years worth of data, put that there and keep the most recent two years on premises, for example, kind of getting that off of the cloud, where you know these could be in the dollars per gigabyte to store, Windows Azure storage is only 12 cents a gig. So you're talking about there'd be a significant cost savings that when we start using Windows Azure as an archive mechanism just to keep that data around. We know it's there, we go get it whenever we need it. A couple of additional scenarios, right? It's the big data. So if you're into uh, Hadoop, Windows Azure, or Microsoft's making a big kind of investment in Windows Server and Windows Azure to let Hadoop 
uh, kind of really be optimized to run on Windows Azure while they're kind of they're working really well with people behind to do. So you can very easily and quickly get a Windows Azure service up and running where you can process data using Hadoop. You can check that out at hadooponazure.com. If you're a high performance computing person, uh, Windows Azure is a great story for HPC. They're adding more and more features to Windows Azure um, to make it work with HPC a little bit better. So if you do like financial risk analysis, weather, weather modeling, um, engineering type of stuff, you use HPC because you just need raw compute power. You just need to spin up a thousand cores in a couple of minutes to get them up and running so you can process some numbers and bring them back down. Maybe then process them with Windows Azure or Hadoop. Uh, HPC works great. There's the Windows Azure HPC scheduler that you can look at that basically lets you take your HPC servers on premise and kind of manage HPC kind of worker nodes in the cloud, right? It's going to spin up a whole bunch of them, schedule them, just dumb machines just because you need compute power, spin them up, and then shut them down. So the cost model there could be nice because you just, you know, that type of infrastructure could be expensive to build out. This gives you a very quick and easy way to do that. Cloud bursting is, I think, a pretty interesting scenario, and there's a really great case study on Kelly Blue, uh, on Microsoft's evidence site about using Kelly Blue Book and what they did um, to dock Windows Azure for a kind of cloud bursting type of scenario. If you read their case study, you'll kind of see what they did and how they kind of put it together. Basically, the story is they had two data centers that Kelly Blue Book had. becoming expensive to maintain two different data centers. One was kind of primary, another one was their secondary data center for kind of short-lived uh, events, maybe like cash for clunkers or new things. Kind of the way they would kind of fail over and have a secondary one for that increase in load. It was becoming very expensive for them to maintain. They had to send engineers to work on those data centers and install new software and just the overall up runtime for those data centers. So our idea was well, let's go to the cloud with Windows Azure <coughs> whenever we have these type of scenarios. Now there is a, a cache for clunkers where people come to our website a lot. We, want, we just get spikes in traffic. What if we use Windows Azure as a secondary data center? We'll just kind of switch our DNS around, then you can burst to the cloud when we need to, and our applications can sit there, and we can scale up as many cores and as much compute power as we need to handle that. And they saved about $100,000 a year in being able to shut down one of their data centers and really use Windows Azure as a secondary one. So I think it's a pretty cool story. I think you see more and more people kind of looking, looking to the cloud as a way to burst and kind of create those hybrid type of solutions. So let's spend a little time talking about Windows Azure Service Bus. The service bus is a great solution for creating those uh, really great messaging and service relaying or routing type of scenarios where I need to put messages in the cloud and then I want to pull them off on the other end. Or I just want to route a service and relay through the cloud. I'm kind of using the cloud as a middleman. So I don't want to have to do a direct connection to from uh, my client to my server or service on premise. I want to use the cloud to kind of relay that traffic around. The nice thing is it's really designed well to work around NAS and firewalls. It can really cause a, uh, a lot of havoc in service management or be expensive to kind of work around in your DMZs and how you want to kind of build that networking infrastructure. Service bus is important to note is secured via access control services. So if you, we'll talk a little bit about ACS coming up, but basically gives you a nice way to say, hey, I'm going to secure everything with ACS. You have to authenticate here. It's the kind of built-in security mechanism or security as a service identity management solution within Windows Azure, and service bus leverages that. So one of the options we have with service bus, they're kind of relaying option. We have our service here, our on-premise service. Maybe this is our, um, what's a good service? Our ninja service or something, I don't know. And we have our client application here. So typically, right, if our client wants to connect, we have to maybe stand up um, an IS servers and DMZ and you know all this kind of nasty kind of networking type of stuff in here. But that's a lot of kind of just junk we have to put in place to get access to that service. So what we can do is leverage the service bus up in the cloud. These are a bunch of front-end nodes. We don't really care where they're at. There's just a bunch of computers up here that we can connect to. And we have a namespace that we can work with. So it'd be like michaelcollier.servicebus.windows.net. And this could be our funny ninja service. So our service registers itself when it starts up. says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to register myself on the service bus. This is going to be the address here that people can come talk to me on. And I can get through, wasn't I making an outbound connection? It's really easy for me to make an outbound connection much more than an inbound connection, right? I go outbound. I can get past some of this stuff, open up a, a bi-directional socket to socket forwarder here. So I've created an outbound, but I can also now send inbound connections through or inbound traffic through. I tell my client, hey, this is the address that I'm going to be on. Let's kind of let's talk. So the client application says, hey, I want to make a service call out to this namespace, and it connects to a different front end node in Windows Azure. Behind the scenes, the service bus is like, hey, these two guys want to talk to each other, so let's meet on the corner by the mailbox that we put a check mark on. And we'll go ahead and make that routing connection over. So any traffic comes in here, I want you to go over here and send that request back down to that service. So 
We don't have to worry about a, a direct connection yet. We can route messages through here and on the client side and the service side. It's basically a WCF configuration change. I change the URL that I'm working with and the bindings. There are relay bindings that you add in. Say it's, you know, uh, was a basic HTTP relay, and now we have a relay system in place. So I don't have to really change any code. It's a WCF configuration change, and we're up and running. The kind of nice thing about this solution, though, while we're using the cloud as a relay, there's a, right, a little bit of a latency hit because we're routing stuff through the internet. I have this kind of guy in the middle now to worry about. But you can make a configuration change and say, hey, you know, instead of doing this, if it's available, if you can figure it out, I want you to go ahead and upgrade me to a direct connection. So I have seen do some NAT probing, figure out, okay, where are each other at, what's our IP addresses and ports, and how can I get a direct connection? And then if you can figure that out, upgrade <coughs> into a direct connection behind the scenes and just make that work. So now you've taken out the service bus as kind of the middleman. Now you've figured out how to route traffic automatically behind the scenes and you're direct connected. It's kind of the uh, analogy is, you know, I'm transferring files to someone else over instant messenger and starts off maybe slow because I'm routing stuff to the cloud. And then it gets faster because it's figured out where we're at now. We figure out the direct connection to get there. Is there any kind of a caching service available with the service bus? There's, with the service bus itself? No. You have Windows Azure caching that you could add into your service. Like if you wanted a service, your service down here to leverage caching, you could leverage Windows uh, you know, Azure caching. But the service bus itself doesn't have a caching solution. Yes, sir? What protocols are uh, typically, it started out with TCP. You had to open up those ports. Now you have an HTTP as well. You can send stuff over HTTP. Yep. There's some people that have problems with you know, firewalls and opening up certain TCP ports, but now Microsoft has fixed this. So you can just run over HTTP port 80 as well. So we talked about routing, routing services through the cloud. Another option is Windows Azure uh, Service Bus queues. We already talked about there's kind of two queues in Windows Azure, and this is where it can get kind of confusing. There's Windows Azure storage queues, where they're the first queues that came out. I call them kind of the, you know, the grade school version of queues. And now we have Windows Azure Service Bus queues, which are kind of the enterprise grown up version of queues. Um, they are the more robust, durable, um, enterprise type of features available in Service Bus queues. One a couple of differences is service bus queues are backed by SQL Azure, so they have a high availability of feature to them. Windows Azure queues are not backed by you know, SQL Azure, so they're kind of you're, they're not they're not guaranteed for an HA type of solution. For service bus queues are, and they're backed by SQL Azure, which is nice. You can store up to a gigabyte per queue, and you can really keep the messages in your queue as long as you want. There's no maximum time to live on them. With Windows Azure queues, there is a maximum time to live of seven days. If you don't pop a, pop a message off and delete it after seven days, it gets garbage collected by the system. Windows Azure queues, you can leave them there pretty much for as long as you like, up to you know you reach that storage account limit, um, storage limit on that queue though. Another difference is that you can store a 256K message in a service bus queue. With Windows Azure queuing, your max size is 64 kilobytes on that message. There's several other differences. To these as well, um, service bus queues have the idea of deduplication detection. They have correlation IDs and session IDs, um, so you can kind of do a little bit more stuff of, of transactions, so to speak. Um, you can chain messages together by using their correlation IDs. So there's several more advanced features to Windows Azure service bus queues. Also, you have different interfaces available to them. Service Windows Azure storage queues are only available via a REST interface. That's the native interface for Windows Azure storage. But on the service bus side, you have a messaging API, the brokered messaging classes, brokered messaging classes available. So you have a .NET interface to them at that level. You also have a WCF interface. If you want to go over WCF and you like that type of programming model, just put it in configuration and, and be done with it, you have that. And there's just REST interfaces as well. You have a standard REST-based protocol that you can work with. So you have more communication type of options to work with. 
right, these are the basic type of, of queues. It's a little message in a queue. I can have multiple receivers behind the scenes, which is nice for, you see it kind of called a, a load leveling type of scenario, right? So the more messages come into the queue, I can kind of look at it and say, hey, I need more workers to process these messages off and I have more and more receivers of them deal with that. And when that load kind of levels off, I can scale back down and well. it gives you that elasticity that we have with the cloud and the nice features there. Another option was service bus that we have. Okay. Is service bus topic, more a pub sub type of model we have. So this is taking service bus queues really to uh, the next level. It gives us more more advanced features now. So we can go in and have a model that looks kind of like this, right? So we have we can have up to 2,000 subscriptions on a single topic, so I could easily add a bunch more of these guys if I wanted. This is a subscription is a virtual queue. A, a subscription, talking too much today. A subscription is a virtual queue. So every time I publish a message to this topic, the subscription gets a copy of that message. Remember, I can have 2,000 subscriptions on that topic. Subscriptions can also have rules. And the really cool thing about the subscriptions with the rules, I think, is these filters and actions. So when I have a subscription, I can apply rules to it, and I can say, for this particular subscription, I want to apply a filter. And the filter is a SQL 92 type of syntax, so I can say where property equals value. So I can easily say, hey, for this subscription, I want to only get cars where the model is for. For example, I can have maybe my message has a, a model property on it. So I say, well, Ari, any forward cars, I want you to go to this particular subscription. And then when you get them, I want you to change the make of that Ford to Mustangs. So maybe that car has a make and a model property. I want you to change that to Mustangs. So any messages I pull off of this subscription by these receivers here, they'll have their properties changed to be a Ford Mustang. I don't have to write that code. I just, when I set up the subscription, I say, hey, here's the, the where clause. I want you to pick up these messages, and here's the action I want you to take on these messages. I could have another subscription down here that maybe this one doesn't have any rules on it. It's maybe an audit, an audit tack kind of approach. Any messages I send to this topic, I want to make sure that this subscription gets them, and it's just an audit receiver. So every message I get is going to go and be logged, but only Ford Mustangs are getting here, and I can scale these guys' receivers out to process all the Ford Mustangs that are being ordered. That concept makes sense? Cool. So which one would you want to choose? Relay messaging is really built for WCF. It's I want to push messages onto the queue. It's a push type of model, so I'm going to route messages through the cloud as a service relay. It's really more about routing our services. I'm just kind of figuring out a routing mechanism because the direct connection is something maybe we don't want to do. I can use the cloud as a routing mechanism. Whereas on the broker messaging, which is our service bus uh, queues and topics, I have more options available how I want to work with that. I want to work with it from WCF or REST or a .NET. I have much more different options to work with it on. And it's a pull type of model, right? So I'm pushing messages into a queue, and I'm trying to pull them back down again at some other time or a, a topic. And it's the eventually consistent type of model. I think you'll see this model becoming more pre prevalent in Windows Azure and Service Bus and just kind of architecture in general, because this one, um, being that kind of instant connectivity does have some drawbacks to it. If you lose a connection somewhere along the way, like your service on your side has a problem, you can't connect and register to the cloud, and obviously your clients can't get there either because they're relying on all points being up. But the broker messaging gives you that idea that, hey, just push into the queue or push into that topic, and I'll eventually we'll get consistent and get caught, caught back up. So it gives you more flexibility and ability to handle a failure or something else should something go wrong. This was a slide I just thought was funny, so I put it in here. Clemens Vaster, if you guys follow him, he's basically one of the big um, architects behind the Windows Azure Service Bus. He has a lot of great information on his blog and Twitter, um, really passionate behind Service Bus. And I thought this was a nice one. You know, basically with Service Bus, you can connect all things with a Service Bus. You can do some pretty cool stuff with that. So if you're not into Service Bus, I definitely would check that out. Follow Clemens um, on Twitter or just check out his blog. He's got a lot of good, good fun stuff there. Let's look at a few other options with the service bus or with that connectivity. I'm trying my mouse pointer to fire. So one of the things I want to spend a couple minutes talking about real quick here is access control service. It's not really a way to um, do connectivity as far as a hybrid type of approach, but you see access control services with Windows Azure service bus is how you have to use ACS for authentication with the service bus. 
So the idea here is with ACS, it's really you don't need to build your own identity management solution. We're going to outsource identity um, identity as a service to ACS. So here I can leverage things, you know, different identity providers like Windows Live or Google or Facebook or even my Active Directory systems on premises. There's nothing that says that ACS is only a a social networking type of solution. You see customers that really need to do uh, social providers for maybe uh, public customers, but they use their Active Directory systems for their internal customers as well, or internal kind of users. But they only want one identity solution, so they're kind of federating that out using ACS as a way to do that, so they can tap into their social networks and their corporate AD systems as well. So that, uh, ACS gives you the identity piece. We've authenticated you with somebody else, but then your application can use claims that you get back handle the authorizations. So we're going to get claims back that says, Mike, yeah, this, this is Mike, he's in a certain role in my company, this is his email address. I can then instrument my application to say, at normal, you know, if this user is authorized for this role, or is user is in role type of stuff, and make those decisions in my application. The I think, last point is kind of the, the key one when I talk to people about ACS, is that you can easily tap into Active Directory, Facebook, Windows Live, Google, Yahoo, all that stuff on your own, right? They all have their own APIs, and people know how to do that. Tapping into them all is kind of a developer nightmare scenario, right? I have to support all these different things, and what if Facebook changes their their uh, API for some reason, which is you know, known to happen, right? They change that, then you have to go back and make that code updates. Nice thing about ACS is you as a developer really just have to write very little code to work with ACS. You write to ACS, and you configure which identity providers you want to work with. So you can say, I want to work with Facebook and Windows Live, and those are the only two I want to work with, and then Microsoft deals with the rest. You can then very easily change and say, I don't want to work with Facebook anymore. I want to only work with Google and Yahoo. I go into a configuration portal, check check boxes, and we're ready to go, and my application updates. I don't have to worry about how I want to deal with anything else. I just say, here's the new identity providers you have, pull information back in. As long as those other providers give you the right claim if you need your application, you'll be okay. As far as an additional way to kind of connect systems, we talked to, talked a little bit about um, the idea at the beginning on you know, Windows Azure Connect. And Connect is a way to really connect servers on premises to the cloud. It gives us a way to create a, basically a private a, a VPN connection, an IPv6 connection between my on premises servers and Windows Azure. So it's really great for those hybrid type of scenarios where I need maybe to keep SQL app or to keep SQL server on premises because I can't or won't move to the, to the cloud. I put my web roles in Windows Azure. And then I say, I want to make a VPN connection basically with Windows Azure Connect to my SQL Azure database, or SQL, excuse me, SQL Server database. And my web rules are running there, they can make a connection down and tap into my SQL Server running on premises. So I can do nice stuff and create those hyper type of applications there. <coughs> I can even domain join my applications too, really creating my web rules and worker roles in the cloud is basically an extension of my enterprise using Windows Azure Connect. I can configure I'm all the setup and management for that to so see how these machines are connected. So as I kind of, kind of drive in this a little bit deeper, our application here, we have some dev machines, databases, and our Windows Azure roles. Uh, for these Windows Azure roles, I need to kind of configure Windows Azure Connect as part of my service model. Just like I would set up remote desktop and anything else with my Windows Azure application, I have to set up Windows Azure Connect so that Windows Azure knows when it deploys those applications to put the Connect software in place, get that ready to go. And then on my local machines on-premises, I have installed a Windows Azure Connect agent. Now, it only works today on, on Windows boxes, so it's not going to work on your Linux boxes or Unix boxes. You need to connect those. You have to wait uh, for additional services to come there. But right now, you can install them on your Windows boxes, so I can very easily set up that these machines on premise, these database servers, and these dev machines now work with Windows Azure and have a nice, easy connection between the two. <laughs> you can control the different policies and how you want different machines to be, to communicate what groups they're in, so I have only these database servers can talk to these particular web roles and so forth. Let's kind of look at the, the tail of the tape and see where you might kind of consider one or the other. And I think the easiest way to distinguish Windows Azure Connect from Windows Azure Service Bus, if you're looking to connect servers, if you need physical server access, then that's Windows Azure Connect. Connect is for servers. They connect individual servers on my data center to individual web roles running in Windows Azure. If I'm looking at connecting services, I want to create more of an NSOA type of approach. I just need to maybe do message routing or message relaying with uh, on my services level, and that's where Windows Azure Service Bus is going to come into play. I have, you know, I can do that with Service Bus with multiple different protocols, with HTTP or TCP or SPS. Um, I can easily take advantage of other services as well from applications to be able to go there. Very, uh, 
servers, connect, services, service bus. So really quick, I got a couple slides on Windows Azure integration services. I think it's one of those uh, kind of cool new things that's coming with Windows Azure. Doesn't get a lot of talk yet. Um, I haven't done a whole lot of work with this guy. A lot of guys at New Desert that are big into like the biz talk space. They're really excited about some of this stuff with, with the integration services. It's really kind of building on the Windows Azure service bus that we have now, kind of adding more and more features to that. So a couple of options with uh, integration services. We have these EAI bridges. They really allow us to kind of do a bunch of message transformation, routing, enrichment, as we kind of process through a normal workflow type of pipeline. So as it comes, in, a message comes in via XML on HTTP, right now is the only way to get messages in. I can then pass it through these different bridges and say, hey, I want you to enrich this data, maybe transform this data for, to, for a different format, manipulate that somewhat in some way, and pass it on to a different stage in the kind of the workflow and take different actions on the way. And when we get done with it, I can send that, that same XML back out via HTTP. Maybe it has to go to another web service somewhere else, or I can go to a service plus message queue, or even another bridge on the way to do more work. So I can kind of decompose the application on the way. You also have the idea of transforms, right? So we talked about the transforms you can do with the bridges, and this is going to give you the ability to kind of change the XML structure along the way. You get a very biz talky looking type of uh, interface now in the cloud. So this kind of interface here, or Visual Studio, you can take and develop that, move that interface, move that kind of mapping relationship into Windows Azure, and then Windows Azure handle all that mapping for you. So it's kind of you're seeing the transformation of BizTalk that you know you install on premises is now moving into the cloud, taking those services, the a service type of thing. So it's pretty easy for you to to move that there. You also have Service Bus Connect. Service Bus Connect is a really cool feature. It's so really about uh, kind of combining two technologies, really taking Windows Azure Service Bus Relay, the message relay that we talked about, and BizTalk adapters that we have today, and kind of combine those two into being Service Bus Connect. So the idea here is I could very easily enable my applications running in Windows Azure to connect to Oracle and Siebel, and other services are typically more difficult to connect to, because I have these BizTalk adapters that already know how to talk to them, but now I can attach these adapters and let them hook into the Windows Azure Service Bus Relay, so now I can pass those messages back and forth and easily get on premises as well. You also have the idea with, with EDI, Microsoft's building in some EDI support into the service bus with a trading partner management portal that'll be, that is available. So you guys set up all your trading partners and how they're going to uh, work with each other and the kind of workflow that goes in with them. I thought this was personally was interesting because I started my career at uh, Sterling Commerce in, in Dublin. Uh, now they're owned by IBM, but they were a big EDI company. So we did a whole lot of stuff with purchase orders, 850s, and all the stuff I wish I could forget, but I can't on EDI. But this is kind of interesting because now you can basically kind of do some of this type of stuff, lightweight type of trading partner management in Windows Azure is coming. So I can send in messages via HTTP and FTP and AS2 also that are popular with EDI people and EDI space and let all that stuff kind of sit there, go through the pipeline, get transformed, do the enrichment that I need to do and process that all as part of a cloud-based solution. The, these integration services are available as a CTP. You can get those out at portal.appfabriclabs.com. You can sign up there for the service, download the SDKs, download the documents. It's still early, it's still a CTP. But you can kind of get access to it and see, hey, this is where Microsoft is going with this type of technology. So kind of get closer to wrapping this up here, right? So it's enabling the, the hybrid type of enterprise. We have all these different services that we can leverage, right? We have on premises today, we have our Windows Server, you know, kind of enabled with Windows Azure, our Windows Server app fabric that we can take advantage of. We have our BizTalk server and the adapters that it gives us and the familiar, that type of platform. We can easily take our existing investments here, leveraging maybe Active Directory federation services so you can authenticate and easily get into Windows Azure Service Bus. So maybe we push messages to Service Bus or pull messages off Service Bus. We can also then tap into Windows Azure, right? So we can say, I want to burst to the cloud maybe, leverage some compute roles, I want to put storage up there maybe for data archiving purposes, I want to leverage SQLite in the database because I maybe can leverage that with my compute roles to do some type of work. So I can now mix this type of environment having a real hybrid type of solution where now I can really take the best of both worlds, the things that work really well in the cloud, leverage them, and take in the things that work really well on premise as well. So this allows you to really have a new platform for your services. We have our existing stuff with SQL Azure and and a SQL Server and Windows Server and Windows Azure, we have all that technology as our hard platform. We have .NET that we work with today, and we know and love that type of environment. We have our management solutions with you know, System Center Operation Manager or SCOM. SCOM can manage your existing on-prem servers as well as your Windows Azure servers, so one kind of management solution that can manage both can be nice. And with the platform services, now we have things like 
you know, Windows Azure caching that we can take advantage of. We have our service bus and our messaging now as a service, access control as a service, our integration services, we just talked about those, as well as more of our composite type of applications with our workflow, running workflow type of solutions in Windows Azure as well. So you see we have these various mix of different types of services now that we can use to give us that agility, pick the pieces we want to build out that type of hybrid, uh, our uh, hybrid application. So kind of wrap up then here, we talked really quick about Windows Azure and overview, talked about different pieces we have, our core components, our, our compute, our storage, and our database, and the various kind of ancillary services like data market and traffic manager and access control that go around with it. We've seen that over the years, you're seeing a trend towards hybrid, um, getting more into that and kind of seeing how cloud computing can help us with that hybrid and what kind of scenarios and concerns we can talk about mm -hmm. there. And a really kind of a more detailed look, um, maybe may not that that detailed, we didn't see any code, maybe the 10,000 foot level on Windows Azure Service Bus and what we can do with that as far as message relaying and service routing and Windows Azure Connect and how we can route uh, message route traffic basically from on-prem servers to our web roles in Windows Azure. So if you want to get started, go out to bit.ly slash Windows or bit.ly slash Azure trial and see, you can sign up for a 90 day free trial of Windows Azure. Sign up for that, you get a lot of resources actually for free. You do need a credit card to sign up and it's really just to prove that you're a human being, that you're not gonna create the world's largest spam machine, Windows Azure. Download the Windows Azure SDK. You can download that at bit.ly slash Azure SDK MC. Download that and you're ready to go. So you got your trial for 90 days and your SDK and you can start playing with all this stuff. As far as where you get more information on some of this stuff, I would definitely check out the Windows Azure platform training kit. Now uh, the training kit has a wealth of information. If you're into HPC, you want to more, more about what you can do with HPC schedule for Windows Azure, they have a hands-on lab in there on that. We talk about Hadoop type of stuff there as well. If you want to get more just on Service Bus, as you go to windowsazure.com and drill into the features section, and there's a Service Bus link in there where you can read more and jumping off place for Service Bus. I uh, definitely recommend following Rick Garibay at rickgarabay.net. He's a colleague of mine at Nudesic. He's a Connected Systems MVP and is big into the Service Bus and things you can do with that. He's got a lot of really good information on, on that. I rely on him a lot for my service bus knowledge. He has more information out on our connected systems page off of newdesic.com as well. Um, on the service bus samples, if you want to see some cool samples and things you can do with Windows Azure, there's how you can kind of assemble the pieces together, maybe like running uh, service bus, containing a service bus from Silverlight. Maybe that's a little bit different just because of the whole the async uh, model has to work. Servicebus.coplex.com. And if you want to just kind of get a really detailed breakdown of where Windows Azure queues fit and where uh, service bus queues fit and all the different differences between them, uh, where the kind of pros and cons are for each one. MSDN has a very nice write up on that. I think if you just search Windows Azure queues and service bus queues, uh, compare them, you'll get linked to that one uh, pretty quickly. Kind of last thing I want to point out is a little plug for a conference that I'm putting together with Eric Boyd, who's also here speaking, and Brian Prince. We're doing a cloud develop conference in Columbus. So I know it's on the campus of Ohio State, so if you're a Michigan fan, just come on down. It's okay. It's not we, won't, we won't hurt you that much. <laughs> it's not okay. Not okay? <laughs> I'm looking forward to this year. It's going to be at the games. It's going to be fun. Uh, but anyways, you come on the campus on Friday, August 3rd, before school starts, before the masses of students arrive back on Ohio State. It's going to be a conference um, on cloud, develop, cloud development techniques overall, not just Windows Azure, but have Windows Azure, uh, Amazon, Google, App Harbor, Heroku. I hope to have lots of different speakers and lots of different cloud topics. If you're interested or have an idea for a speaker, uh, definitely contact us via uh, our cloud develop site or contact me here. We'll be opening up speaker registration uh, hopefully next week. We get everything put together and um, registration for the conference should open up in early May as well. So keep that on your calendars for Friday, August 3rd. And we've got a few minutes left. Is there any, if I can get this to work, questions? Food coming from all the pork. So I'm good. I didn't eat before this, so <laughs> hope you left me some. So as far as yes. uh, like you're talking about using maybe leveraging the cloud for storage of archiving and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. how robust? I mean, I would assume it's pretty strong, but how robust is the backup of that data either across multiple centers or um, that kind of thing? Inside a Windows Azure data center, the data is replicated three times for high availability reasons within that data center. So if there is a failure, hardware-wise, that impacts one replica, you have two more replicas in that data center, so you're still okay, and then Microsoft will pick up, create a third one, 
So there's a third um, shortly after the failure. But also there's geo-replicated data behind the scenes as well as a secondary data center. So if, micro, if your primary data center is Chicago, for example, and something happens at Chicago data center and it goes offline and Microsoft can't recover it, they'll fail you over to the secondary data center which has a backup copy, three more replicas of your data in that data center. And that's an async replication behind the scenes all for free. So you get that kind of for free behind the scenes as part of the platform. If you turn that off, you call Microsoft, so that happens automatically. It's kind of as soon as you sign up, you're into that program. If you call Microsoft and say, hey, I don't want this geo-replicated for whatever reason, 